Thank you, everybody. It's a real honor to speak here at, uh, at ElmConf and to see so many people interested in Elm here. So the subject of my talk is a combination of two languages, Elm on the one hand and Futhark on the other. Elm is a language that we know and love. Uh, Futhark is not so well known. If you are curious about the name, it's, it is not the name of a Star Trek language, but rather it's the first six letters of an ancient runic alphabet, which you see on that inscription below. So the question is, what can we do with these two languages together that we might not be able to do with them apart? And uh, there's a precedent for this kind of a combination, namely Elm and WebGL. Uh, let me give you an example of this. This is something that Andre Kuzman, now let's see, I'm a little brain dead here. Uh, so we'll go to uh, this little demo here. And what you see is a uh, combination of some physics and some 3D graphics. And it's a pretty amazing piece of work because there's a tremendous amount of computation going on there. And as you can see, it's running at mostly 60 frames per second or very close to it. So the reason that this works well is that uh, Andre, well, there are two reasons. One is that Andre is very smart, but he's also using the GPU on the computer. Uh, this might be a good time to introduce the subtitle of the talk, How to Get Elm to Talk to a Supercomputer. The supercomputer, in full disclosure, is the GPU. Uh, GPUs are unlike the CPUs on our computer, which have four to eight cores. They typically have on the order of 100 cores. And some GPUs have up to 1,000 cores or more. So GPUs have lots of cores. They can execute code in parallel, and that means they're really fast. So you saw that in the demo that Andre rigged up there. Uh, parallel programming, however, is not so easy. It's notoriously hard, in fact. And one of the points of this talk is that Futhark makes it easy. We can write code that kind of looks like Elm code, as a matter of fact. And then a smart compiler does the hard work of producing highly optimized code for the GPU. Uh, here's the creator of Futhark, Trolls Henriksen. He's a rec recent PhD at the University of Copenhagen. And there's his official site. It's got lots of practical stuff, how to install Futhark, uh, how there's some tutorials, there's a manual, and there are references to some very interesting theoretical papers. So lots of interesting type theory, in fact. Uh, here's an outline of what I'm going to try to do in uh, half an hour. First of all, I'll say a little bit more about what Futhark is, why we might be interested in it, talk about a real world problem. The one that I want to concentrate on is classifying fossil bones. It could be almost any classification problem, but this is a fun one to do. And this leads into something else, and I must issue a trigger warning here. We're going to talk about math. Uh, so classifying fossil bones, believe it or not, leads to problems with matrices and to sort of the canonical hello world problem of parallel programming matrix multiplication. So we'll talk about that. And then we'll do a brief Futhark course. In five minutes, we can learn a lot, I think. And I also want to discuss a standard pitfall in parallel programming. It's one that I fell into, and it's good to be aware of it. And then finally, I want to talk about how we can make Elm and Futhark communicate. What I will describe as a very Rube Goldberg solution, and I want to uh, advertise the possibility of doing something much, much better, something that I think will open Elm to many new application areas. And I think that's the really exciting part of this. So let's get started. What is Futhark? Well, it's a functional language. It's pure. It's immutable. And it's statically typed. Does that sound familiar? Uh, just like Elm, right? A little difference is that it's a, well, Trolls advertises it as an array language. Uh, most of what it's concerned with is computations with arrays, which are very much like lists, but a little bit different. Uh, for one thing, there are some size annotations which help the, the compiler to make, construct good code. It's a little bit like dependent types, but not quite. And then there's a very interesting feature, in-place update. So it's actually possible to 
reassign values to elements of an array without destroying all those good properties that I just mentioned above, like immutability. Uh, how you do this, it seems like a contradiction, doesn't it? But there's some tricky type theory that I don't yet understand that allows you to do this. Uh, this is important because it means that certain algorithms that would take O of n squared time can be done in O of n time. So that means that when you scale the problem up, uh, it scales linearly rather than quadratically, i.e. it doesn't take as long. Okay, here's a little code snippet. I won't say too much about it right now, but just stare at that for a moment and close your eyes. It looks very similar to Elm. Uh, one big difference is that, well, we say reduce instead of list.foldl, for example, but uh, it's, uh, it's rather like Elm code. And when we do the short course, we'll talk more about that. The compiler is a very important uh, aspect of this. Uh, it's written in Haskell. That's really not the most important point, but it's interesting because that's also like Elm. Uh, Futhark, the Futhark compiler can compile code to various uh, other languages. C, uh, the, so that's sequential code. It's great for testing, but it's not going to execute as fast. OpenCL and PyOpenCL are uh, compiled for the GPU. PyOpenCL is really just OpenCL except that uh, yeah, it comes with a little bridge so that Python can talk to the GPU. And of course, the main point is that it produces this really good code, code that runs fast. Now, so the compiler is smart. And there's sort of an interesting explanation of why it can do what it does. And the reason it really surprised me when I learned about this is that the input to the compiler is typed functional code. And it turns out that that's the kind of raw material that a compiler can think about and understand and then use that understanding to optimize the code. If you have imperative code, uh, the compiler has a very difficult time in figuring out what the underlying idea of the computation is. Well, OK, lots of good words. Uh, how does it work out in practice? So I'm going to show you some benchmarks of how Futhark code uh, stands up to code from the masters, the big guys, NVIDIA and AMD. Uh, here's the so-called Rodinia test suite. The blue rectangles are for Futhark versus uh, NVIDIA, the red for AMD. The numbers above the rectangles tell you what speed multiple uh, Futhark runs against its computation. So bigger than one is good, a lot bigger than one is really good, and less than one is not so good. So if you look at those numbers, you'll see that uh, most of them are considerably bigger than one. Uh, some are around 80%, so that's, that's OK, but not great. And then there's one. It happens to be for the LUD decomposition. Poof, the LUD decomposition of a matrix. Uh, that's not so good. Uh, bear in mind that Futhark is a very young project, and there's certain optimizations that have not yet been implemented. Here's another uh, set of benchmarks. This is for the hotspot hot spot benchmark. And the gray line is C code. The other two lines are GPU code, where the red, reddish line, the bottom one, is Futhark. So the vertical scale is execution time in microseconds. The horizontal scale is the uh, number of uh, grid elements you have on the edge of some rectangular grid, and you see that C code is not even in the game. And that except for some small discrepancies for very small grid edge sizes, Futhark outperforms uh, the big guys. So there's Trolls uh, again. Uh, I saw a video of a conference talk he gave, and he talked about these benchmarks. That's where I got the figure. And he said, these results are OK. Uh, I'm not sure whether you know, he's an understated person or whether Danish people are, necess are sort of generally understated. But uh, the, the results are actually pretty surprising, in my opinion. So let's now turn our attention to real world problems that we might use Futhark to handle. So one would be simulations, like what uh, Andre did. Uh, another simulation, one of my favorites, is the heat equation. You have some heat map, red means hot, black means cold, in between is in between. Uh, 
and you've got a hot spot, a cold spot, and some random stuff. And if you use the physics of how temperature evolves in time, you get at some later time a picture like that. Turns out that you're just doing a bunch of matrix multiplications. Uh, but we're going to look at a different problem, classifying fossils. Uh, there's a fossil bed. Uh, you have a, some big collection of fossils, and you would like to classify them algorithmically. You know, what species does this bone belong to? Okay, so the first thing you do is you have your graduate student assistants uh, measure all the bones, uh, you know, measure the length, measure the width of various features. And so each bone might lead to an array of 30 numbers, or as we mathematicians like to say, a vector. Okay. Vector, array, I'll mix them up, it's all the same stuff. So one bone is this 30 element vector. We can view it as a point in the 30 dimensional space. Now, you know, if you've done machine learning or big data that's, or, or mathematics, you're probably familiar with that, but remember what you did in high school. Uh, you did analytic geometry in high school. There's the Cartesian plane. There's the point P, which is located by coordinates 4, 2. And an important thing for us is if you draw a vertical line from that point down to the x1 axis, it intersects at 4, that's the projection of the point P onto the x1 axis. And that notion of projection is going to be very important in what we're about to do. OK, so that's one bone, one point in a 30-dimensional space. Uh, what if you have 10,000 bones? Well, you have 10,000 points in the 30-dimensional space. Or you have a cloud of points, which you, if you can visualize that. Now, I am unable to visualize things in 30 dimensions, so I project them down into, into two dimensions. And how do you make sense out of this cloud? Or put in you know, different terms, what does the data look like? It's a 10,000 by 30 matrix. It's 10,000 rows, 30 columns. How can you make sense of this? How can you say, oh, this point that has these components is a hummingbird hip? Or this point is a dinosaur nose bone? Well, that's what we're going to figure out in a second here. So it, it's all contained in this diagram, which I'll try to walk through and explain. Uh, we imagine this cloud of points, but because the points of the cloud correspond to different bones of different species, the cloud is really organized into little subclouds. And we need to have a way of figuring that out algorithmically. So uh, we have species A, species B, species C, species D. And one thing we could do is to project the vectors for those species onto the x1 axis. And if we do that, we see that A and D land on top of each other. So that's not too great. We would say, oh, A and D, those are the same species. But they aren't. Okay? Same with B and C. You could say, OK, well, you chose the wrong axis. Project onto the x2 axis instead. But I rigged this example, so that doesn't work either. So, but what you can do is you can rotate the axes. Instead of using the x1, x2 axes, you use the red x1 prime, x2 prime axes. And now if you project, those points are nicely separated. So let's imagine that A is a hummingbird hip bone. And so it projects to 7.2. Now you have another species, another bone. You say, well, what, what species is this? It happens to project to 7.256. And that's pretty close. It's closer to 7.2 than any of the other points. You say, aha, that is a hummingbird hip bone. So that's the idea. Okay? Now, unfortunately, that leaves unresolved the big question. How do you find the good axes so you can project? And that is, that question leads to the subject of principal component analysis. That's some mathematical black box that will give you the best axis. Uh, it uses matrix magic. Uh, in fact, it uses repeated matrix multiplication. This, by the way, is the same mathematics that goes into Google's PageRank algorithm. OK, so you want to get those principal components. Those are the numbers that we used in the example. Okay. So I'm not going to explain that, but I am going to, we are going to do a little math review and talk about matrix multiplication, because that leads into what GPUs can do for us. So uh, matrix multiplication. Well, I'm going to build up to this. 
The first thing we need to figure out how to do is to take the dot product of two vectors. So there are two vectors, u and v, vectors in the plane, but if we figure out how to do it in the plane in the right way, it'll work for 30 dimensions, 300 dimensions, whatever. So the first thing we do is we take the first component of u, which is 2, the first component of v, which is 3, and we multiply them. We do the same thing with the second component. We multiply them. And then we add the result, and we get 10. So that's the dot product. You might say, what's the use of the dot product? Well, for one thing, you can use it to calculate the angle between vectors. Uh, so you know that makes an obvious sense in two dimensions. But if you figure out how to do it in two dimensions, you use the same formula in three, and that, or 30, and that allows you to say, ah, these two vectors in a 30-dimensional space meet at a 25-degree angle. That, that turns out to be a very useful thing to be able to do. OK, let's ramp up the, the challenge. Let's try to multiply a vector times a matrix. So we have a matrix B, a 2 by 2 matrix, a little square array of numbers, and our vector U from before. And to multiply that vector U times the matrix B, I've got to tell you what the components of the result are. Well, the, the, you see them there. It's 10 and 0, but the question is, how did I get them? And the way I get them is the following. To get the first component of the result, I take the vector u, and I dot it with the first column of the matrix. To get the second column of the result, I dot the vector u with the second column of the matrix. It kind of rhymes, doesn't it? Uh, third column, third column, blah, 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 blah. OK, so we know how to multiply a vector times a matrix. And the last thing we need to figure out is how to multiply a matrix times a matrix. Okay, so the way you, you've got a matrix A, a matrix B. What's the result? Well, I've got to tell you what the rows of the result are. So the first row of the result is the first row of A times the matrix B, which is something that we figured out how to do on the previous slide. The second row of the result is the second row of A times the matrix B. Okay? So we did it. Now, here's the bad news. Matrix multiplication is an O of n cubed operation. That means that if, for example, it takes a microsecond to multiply two 10 by 10 matrices, then it's going to take 1,000 microseconds to multiply two 100 by 100 matrices. So in other words, when we scale the size by a factor of 10, we scale the time by a factor of 10 cubed or 1,000. And that's not so great because, well, look at these results. Uh, a millisecond, a second, we're going to scale by a factor of 10 on the input each time. Now, if something get, takes a second to do that, still in interactive territory. Scale it up another factor of 10, it takes 16 minutes. No longer very interactive. Okay? Another factor of 10, it takes almost 17 hours. So, you know, if your boss asks you to do some analysis and it takes this, you say, sorry, boss, I can't give you this until tomorrow morning. Scale it up another factor of 10, it takes 41 days. Boss it will not accept that. And maybe for a graduate research project, that's okay. You know, graduate students can wait around. <laughs> but let's scale it up another factor of 10, almost three years. No, I'm going to work on a different problem. I've got to get out and make some money and support my family. So, <laughs> O of n cubed problems are computationally not so great. They can be done, but they scale up badly. Uh, that was a theoretical analysis, so let's see how it actually works in practice. So here's a little table of benchmarks that I did myself, so you may want to be slightly skeptical of them. The uh, first column tells you the size of the matrix, and I increase it by a factor of two as I go from row to row. The succeeding three columns give you the time in milliseconds for JavaScript C and Futhark. And the last column gives you the speed up ratio of Futhark relative to C. That is to say, parallel code relative to the best sequential code that we have on, on the screen. So let's just look at the last row, 1,600 by 1,600 matrices. My nice little laptop was able to do that. Okay, so JavaScript took 48 seconds. C took about a third of that time, 14 seconds. Futhark took 153 milliseconds, so that's much, much better. 
the speed up ratio for uh, GPU to CPU was around 90. And the reason it can do these things is, well, A, because GPUs are really fast, but B, because they can run computations in parallel. So indeed, uh, if you're looking at matrix multiplication or related type of problems, uh, parallel computation in a GPU is a good thing to be able to do. Um, okay, so the, the five minute Futhark course. Uh, first thing is Futhark has a REPL, just like Elm. So it's a very good way of experimenting with code. If you're developing code, it's a great way of making sure that it's doing what you want. Some people write tests, and that's also a good thing to do. Uh, so let's see if we can add the components of a vector. Uh, so here's a code that does it. Uh, we have a vector v, and we're simply going to reduce that vector, reduce the components of that vector using the plus operator and a starting value of zero. So that's familiar to all of us in Elm because reduce is just a synonym for list.foldl. Okay, and we test it. Uh, it gives the right result. By the way, notice here that Futhark has done some little type inference for us because the first entry was 1.0. The other entries look like integers, but the compiler looked at that and said, oh, uh, really, what you're really talking about, man, is floating point, 64-bit floating point numbers. Okay, let's see if we can do the dot product. So there's the hand calculation, and there's the corresponding Futhark code, and it works like this. We take the vectors u and v, and we're going to map the multiplication operator over those two arrays. And when we do that, we get a new array, which is the array of pairwise products. Then we're going to reduce that using the plus operator to get the sum of those things. We get 10, and we're good. So we just did the dot product. And remember, that was the foundation for doing all the other stuff. Okay, and of course we test it, and it works. Okay, let's try vector times matrix. There's the hand calculation. There's the Futhark code. This one is a little bit more complicated. Uh, the first thing we have to do is to take the transpose of the matrix B. The transpose is a new matrix whose rows are the columns of the old matrix. And we have to do that because Futhark thinks in terms of rows. And if I'm going to map something over it, and I really want to map over columns, I've got to take the transpose. Okay, so the next thing we do is we're going to map a function over that transposed matrix. And which function are we going to map? Well, the one that takes a row of the matrix and takes the dot product with u. That's exactly what we did in the hand calculation, which is displayed above. Okay, so uh, we only have one more step, which is how to multiply. Uh, well, okay, we, we, check. We, we check the darn thing, okay? So last thing is, how do we multiply a matrix times a matrix? Well, it's getting a little boring now. Uh, it's the same old pattern. Uh, there's the hand calculation. And the Futhark calculation is we're simply going to map over the rows of the matrix A the function that takes a row of A and multiplies it uh, times the matrix B. So once again, the, the nice thing is, is the Futhark code, because it's nice and functional, is almost a word-for-word -word, uh, translation of the verbal description of what you do by hand. And again, we check it, and it works. Okay, so one point of this <laughs> is that Futhark is GPU programming for standard humans. You don't have to be some weird alien superhuman intelligence to do that. It's something that you and I can do. Okay. This is important because there are lots of problems that are too small. You know, the graduate student's problem that maybe involves some specific things that NVIDIA doesn't care about. It's, it, there's no market for it. So there's a large class of problems for which it would be really great if, you know, uh, Joe or Mary can write their code for to get their thesis done or to found their company on. Well, let me talk about the one pitfall in parallel programming that I encountered. Uh, this is a problem that I always like to do. Sum up the reciprocals of the first n integers. Now, that's a series that diverges, something that was known in the 1200s, by the way. Um, so here is my solution. Uh, it seems to be perfectly fine. Uh, 
uh, I take a list of, or an array of integers, I turn them into floating point numbers, and then I'm going to reduce that list uh, using uh, a function that takes an accumulator and a number and forms the accumulator plus the reciprocal of that number. That's the way you would do that. That's the way you do it in Elm and it works. Well, when I ran the code, as it worked. I thought, oh great, this is good, but let me try some really big numbers. I got answers that were clearly wrong. Yeah, what on earth is going on here? So I went back and I recompiled it to C code and ran it. And even with those big numbers, it was slow, but I got the right answer. So I, I didn't understand what was going on. So I wrote Trolls and he says, well, yes, you fell into the canonical pitfall and you have to do it the way that is displayed below in green. And uh, so it's a little bit different. You also are going to map a function over that list of integers. It's the reciprocal function. And then you use reduce plus to add them all up. Equivalent, but it turns out it's different in this case. The reason that it's different is that Futhark, when it parallelizes the code, it rearranges it, it transforms it, makes it run fast, but it also makes certain assumptions. And one of the assumptions is this. The type signature, signature for reduce in Futhark looks like what I've displayed there. The key thing is the reduce function, the reducer, which is the code highlighted in light red. Unlike Elm, that is not A goes to B goes to B, but it has to be A goes to A goes to A, okay? And if it's A goes to A goes to A, then you can view it also as an operator, like the plus function, okay? And the point is that in Futhark, the reducer has to be associative and it has to have a neutral element, uh, just like the plus function, okay? So uh, I have to say it, this is monoid madness. Okay, you have to work in the context of monoids, which is just a very highfalutin way of saying what I already said. Okay, so what's the deal here? There's the bad reducer. There's the bad reducer written as an operator. Ack bang n is ack plus the reciprocal of n. Okay, now let's evaluate x bang y bang z in two different ways. We'll parenthesize it on the left, we get this answer. We parenthesize it on the right, we get a different answer. So it's not associative. So that's why things didn't work out. Okay. Uh, Trolls told me that his compiler is not smart enough yet to detect this sort of thing. It may eventually, but you know, let's be careful. Okay. So now we come to the nitty gritty, communication between Elm and Futhark. So here's how I did it. It's definitely a Rube Goldberg uh, contraption. So we have Elm on the left, the GPU on the right. In the middle, we have a little Python HTTP server. Uh, Elm sends big arrays and some, to Python. Python sends the big arrays and the Futhark code to GPU. The GPU sends it, the data back. Python sends it back to Elm. And as you can imagine, each one of these arrows is a bottleneck, uh, the ones on the left being the biggest bottleneck. The reason I use Python is that Python knows how to talk uh, it understands both Futhark code and the GPU, okay? Uh, I was able to get things running a little better by doing certain kinds of optimization, like I would have uh, Futhark actually compute a PNG image of the result of the computation, and we'd send that all the way back, and that turns out to be more efficient. But what we really want to do is something like this. We have Elm on the left, the GP on the right, and we have some nice JavaScript bridge between the two. Now this is already done with WebGL, and well, why can't we just do it for arbitrary GPU code? And uh, something I learned about when I went to the Elm in the Spring conference in Chicago was that there's something called WebGPU API, which does exactly, I mean, its goal is to do exactly that. And I ran into Luke this morning and he said, uh, well, okay, let me finish this. So, so WebGPU API, you can read all this stuff, it's better in various ways, okay? It's faster, it has the right primitives to do arbitrary computations, which WebGL does not. And um, what Luke told me is that it is now live in Chromium. So I wrote uh, trolls about that, and he said, uh, 
I definitely want Futhark to run in the browser at some point. Blah, 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 blah. I don't think creating a JavaScript backend by itself will be all that challenging. So I hope that all of this becomes a reality because I believe that uh, once Elm and the GPU can communicate via JavaScript with Futark, then many new application areas like classifying fossil bones or other things will be possible. Um, I've actually written part of a PCA library, principal component analysis library, of uh, using Futhark. And it's not too difficult. You know, you need to know the math of the problem, uh, but it was not really more difficult than those functions that I showed you. And uh, also, it's very pleasant that the code is very much like Elm. Um, let's see. Do we have one minute left, or am I over time? OK. So let me show you a couple of quick simulations here, or at least one. Uh, here's a simulation of heat flow. This one it actually is done in pure Elm, and it works pretty well. Uh, you'll notice that uh, you know, as heat flows, things get blurrier and blurrier. Turns out that heat flow is really Gaussian blur. Okay? Now, um, I think maybe I won't show you more than this, but the point is that if you, if you look at the little step counter down there, it's doing pretty well. Seems to be pretty regular. The problem is, is that when you scale things up, say by another fact, you really can't scale it by another factor of 10. Totally impossible, okay? Uh, this little simulation already uses, it creates, uh, well, I ended up doing this with WebGL, but the previous SVG version ended up creating 10,000 DOM nodes, and that's on the border of not very good. So, uh, <laughs> so anyway, I, I won't show you my Futhark simulation, but I do have a YouTube video on it. It's one of my most famous hits. And you can go there and look at that. So thank you very much.